Welcome to Is Anybody Listening to Me podcast with the meat. Uh, this is Big Meat's victory tour today. He's going to be going uh, and gloating about Mac Jones. But before we give him that opportunity, we're going to cover our usual topics of entertainment and other things of, of interest. And then we'll let him take his victory lap. But uh, he's been dying to gloat. He's beaming ear to ear with his success on the draft this year. So let me introduce my partner, Big Meat. What's going on, Big Meat? <laughs> it, it's it's going really well. I think my excitement from from last week um, has has subdued. You know, now that I've get got you know had to calm myself down. I was I was on a uh, uh, I was a little bit excited uh, when Mac Jones got got selected. But you know, he's a, you gotta you gotta act like you've been there before. <laughs> oh, that's right. I I have been there before. So exactly. So it, it's been the year twenty twenty one has been the year of the Big Meat here. Yeah. Yeah, your your success is skyrocketing like Dodge coin. What do you? <laughs> what, what do you, What do you guys? Do you guys want? Uh, you guys want predictions on who's going to win the NBA championship? MLB? What do you? NHL? What do you want? What do you want? I'm here well, for you. Well, save the NHL because that's uh, the Bruins are going to be in the playoffs, so we can talk about that. Um, so we can wait for our third man because he's well, he's I think the big bigger hockey guy than I, than I am. So I'll, I'm not going to, I'll just dabble into that, but why don't we do our usual, but, um, cause over the weekend I got some people asking, well, when are you guys going to discuss mortal Kombat and mm. give us your feedback on it? So I said, all right, we're, we're getting to it. There was just the excitement of the draft, the draft to get through. The draft came first. Yeah. Exactly. So, so, um, in our tradition, we always make some type of recommendation. I did want to give a shout out to, um, a coffee shop that I, I, it's, it's not new, but they closed for a while and they're back open and they closed long before COVID. So this wasn't a COVID issue, but big meat, I think you might remember this cause you and I used to work next to this place. The job is brewing oh, yeah. a coffee shop in Borica. They're back open. And if you haven't tried it, um, if you listen to this podcast and you haven't drove down, uh, I believe it's off a three a in Borica. If you haven't tried this place, you have to. I mean, the, the coffee is good because everything is brewed. It's not the Dunkin' Donuts syrup or the Starbucks syrup. It's actually brewed flavors. So if you're into flavored, different flavors of coffee and you want the real stuff, I give them that's that's great. But their real claim to fame is their muffins. Have you gone there recently, Big Meat? And uh, had not, any of the- <clears throat> no, not recently. But I do remember their their muffins there, and their and the coffee was really good there too. It's been years. You got, you got to bring the kids. It's actually a treat to bring the kids because when I actually grab a half a dozen for the kids back home and they open the box, their muffins are like four times a normal muffin when you get it from like a Dunkin' Donuts or like the market or whatever. It is huge. And if you're going there during the day, if you actually ask them which ones first came out of the oven, they will tell you which one came out and you can actually get a piping hot muffin for breakfast. It is amazing to get it right right when they come out of the oven. They are there's nothing like them. They're just incredible. It's like the only thing I can compare it to is when you go to Krispy Kreme and you get a Krispy Kreme donut and it's fresh right off their little assembly line thing that they do and you get them and it's piping hot in the in that um I don't know if it's a, that glaze is still kind of like gooey. That's that's how there's nothing matches that as a donut and nothing matches a Java's brewing muffin when you get it fresh out of the oven. So if you haven't done it with the kids and you know who would love it, it'd probably be JC mm-hmm. probably like fall over with the size of that thing. It's probably bigger than yeah. his head. I think. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. You're huge. <laughs> but, uh, um, your, 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 your daughters and, uh, your little guy would actually love it. So I'm just, yeah. Jo- yeah, I, I do remember. It's been, like I said, it's been a long time, but I remember that place being really, really good. And and I didn't even know they were, they were closed. They, they were closed for COVID and then they just reopened? No, they were closed before COVID. They just randomly shut down. I have, and, and they remodeled the inside. So the inside's remodeled too. And it's, when I used to go there, I remember seeing the owner and talking to the owner and there was a guy that used to be there. I, I think he used to manage the place. I haven't seen him. He's like, I've not seen these guys at all. So I don't know if it's under new ownership. Like the muffins taste the same and everything tastes the same, but I just don't know if it's new ownership. I, I mean, honestly, I don't know if times have changed, but it's basically all 
looks like either they're high school girls or you know how like some mm. like coffee shops are like all high school age girls or yeah. or maybe like freshmen in college or whatever like that's they all look young like it's all young kids like working everything and there's like yeah. four or five so it's much more um heavier staff than it used to be and but they're <clears> packed like there are still lines to get mm. in there and covid makes it a little tricky because it was a small place but if you're in the bill ricca area you got to stop in it's it's if you're drinking dunkin donuts and you're buying that crap off their rack you got to go and get a real breakfast treat branch, i do it like once a week out. Yeah. yeah it's it's my it's my treat once a week yeah, because it, you know, it'll get it'll tide me over for lunch because that you can eat that thing and you can snack on it all day because it's so damn big, but it's so heavy. But just got to give a shout out to it. And their breakfast sandwiches are really good too. They're they're giant, and I think they bake their own bagels too. So everything's mm. fresh when you go in there. Mm. Oh, I gotta check it out. Yeah, I gotta try. It's been a while since I've been, you know, in Billerica for really anything. Um, you know, last time I worked there it was over over ten years ago. So that's probably the last time I've been there. Yeah. Um, but there's other, I mean, there's other coffee shops, and I can't, rem- I can't remember some of the names. Uh, but you know, if you're going to Dunkin' Donuts, you know, and that's your regular spot, or even Starbucks, and you go to these places, and it's like, okay, whatever, they're franchises. You go in, but if you haven't, if you don't regularly visit, not regularly, but like once a week, even just go into one of these local um, uh, coffee shops, and it's just the 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 taste of the coffee, the the freshness of the of the baked goods that, that are in those. I mean, there it's like night and day compared to what you would get at like Dunkin's or Starbucks. Yeah, and that's actually a, that's a really good one there in, in Billerica. I remember that one being one of the one of the better ones around. So, yeah, uh, absolutely, it's good good recommendation. It's my um, it's probably my first favorite coffee shop, and then I would say Heavenly Donuts is my second because they're again they brew all the flavors. It's not syrup. I mean, they have the syrups if you're someone that likes that stuff, but. They have tons of flavor, and I just like that. I just like the real stuff. Like you can taste the coffee. Like it's a real coffee, not like a sh- basically like a sugary drink that you can buy off a market basket shelf. It's, and Starbucks is the worst food out of any of the fast food. Places. I don't even know why people would get food out of Starbucks. It's all pre-packed. Like their banana bread comes in individually packaged, and I'm yeah. like, and and yeah, it's so funny. Fresh. They take it out of the plastic to put it in a paper thing and hand it to you. I'm like, why don't you just give it to me in the plastic? It, it, what does it matter if it's in a, your Starbucks wrapper or it comes yeah. in the cheap packaging wherever you bought it from? So it's, it's all it's all presentation. Yeah, uh, it's all presentation. It's, I can tell you how disappointed it is when they they take that sandwich and they open up a piece of plastic seal and they take your sandwich and stick it in their little toaster and you're like, oh yeah, yeah. it has a breakfast sandwich. <laughs> that's what that's what I was looking for. So I could have done that out of the frozen aisle out of market basket would have been a- just as good. <laughs> And it's sad because actually, I think Market Baskets actually sell fresh baked like egg sandwiches and stuff. Yeah. So why, why even go to like? What? It's just crazy. It's just crazy. Um, and the, the money you're spending. What, that's <laughs> what we got to do. We got to go for the uh, the breakfast, the best breakfast sandwich around, and we'll do a little, uh, um, uh, you know, waiting. You know, what did we do? Like a scale on on which one's the best one? Like we did with the cheese steak, with the cheesesteak. And, um, you know, chances are Market Basket's going to end up winning that one, too. Yeah. So, See, that's tough. I That's a real egg sandwich. And, you know, it's funny because McDonald's, people knock McDonald's as food, but I think McDonald's is a better egg sandwich than most of the other places. It's they're actually a McMuffin real egg. Is. Yeah, their yeah. McMuffin is, is legit. Yeah. yeah. I'm, 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 I always tell that to the kids because I'm like, I'm not sure because they love the Dunkin' Donuts sandwiches. I'm like, guys, that is like the worst sandwich yeah. like those are like pre-made like mass-produced yeah, pre- patties process, pre-packaged yeah, yeah. Not, i remember somebody from dunkin donuts years ago who worked there actually told me she, she was i mean i don't know if she was just kind of sick of making the egg sandwiches there or whatever but she was like look you shouldn't be ordering the egg sandwiches here it's like you want to you want a real sandwich with like real egg go to mcdonald's and she was yeah. this girl worked at dunkin donuts telling yeah. me this and i i said yeah, I hope your manager is not, uh, you know, not around to, to hear you say that. But, uh, but you know, when they're telling you that, then it must. Be yeah, true. yeah, you got to. I mean, I, I, I know they're popular coffee shops and people like it because they're quick and Dunkin's is inexpensive. But yeah, like my kids are like, why? Like I'll drive right by a Dunkin' Donuts and they're like, where are we going? I'm like, you want a sandwich? I'm not getting it from Dunkin'. I refuse to. I'm going to heavenly. Like, and I'm going to get you guys some real sandwiches if we're on the go. Like, I just can't watch them eat 
a McDonald's sandwich. I it's just I'm not McDonald's, a Dunkin' sandwich. It's just gross. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, speaking of gross and graphic and all that stuff, let's get into Mortal Kombat. Something that yes. we were very excited about. And it lived up, it was graphic. It it <laughs> it had a lot of gore. They did not hide, they did not shy away. I think they did even more than compared to the the first version of this movie that came out in the mid or early nineties. I think we talked about. I think mid nineties, yeah, ninety five. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's right. Mid nineties at that point. So much more graphic. I actually enjoyed it. I know there was some weird reviews on it and this. I thought the story was better than the first story, but mm-hmm. I'll I'll take your take on it, Big Meat. I, I did uh, I did enjoy it as well. I I, I read the uh, the reviews. Uh, a lot of people were bashing it, um, but when I I didn't even really read any of the reviews. I, I watched it first so I can come up with my own opinion. And by the time it ended, I said, "Oh, that was actually pretty good. There was some good fight scenes, very gory, which, which I liked. I thought yeah. the story was pretty good. Some great memorable characters uh, that was in it. Some of them were kind of boring, but some of them were really good." Uh, especially the, I forget his, was it Kane? Uh, I'm saying his name wrong. What was the, the guy with the Australian accent? He was the guy with the, the, uh, Kano, um, Kano, Kano, Kano. Kano. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he reminded me a lot of, of the character in the boys, just the way he was swearing all the time, just kind of like, (laughs) you know, and I loved it. I loved his character in it. Every, every time he was on screen, I was like, I couldn't wait to hear what he, what he had to say next. (laughs) <laughs> so I thought the movie was good. In fact, I I watched the original Mortal Kombat, of course, a long time ago. It actually prompted me to want to go and watch. Like, I still haven't gone around to, to watching it again, but now I want to actually watch the 1995 version so I can kind of compare the two because I don't really remember it all that much. And, that, and um, so I'm going to end up doing that that soon, but... As far as this movie goes, I thought it was I thought it was solid. The only thing I would say, and this is kind of some of the complaints that you're you're starting to hear in the reviews, is that it's supposed to be about this big Mortal Kombat tournament, and that tournament never takes place in the movie. It's just kind of building up to the tournament to try to prevent the tournament, and it just never happens. So it's just it's just all fights kind of off to, off on the side. But the way it ends, it leaves you on a little bit of a cliffhanger that, yeah, they're definitely going to make sequels to it, and that tournament is eventually going to come. So I like that they're trying to build it out into almost a series of movies as opposed to just kind of this one-and-done movie. And I think, um, I think, it's, I think uh, they're the, the, the next ones that are going to be coming out, especially with that one big character that was missing that's a very popular character in the, uh, in the video game. Uh, he wasn't in this one, but they teased it at the very end that he is coming in the next yeah. movie, I think it's only going to get better and better. I'm actually looking forward to the next, to the sequel when they, when they get around to it. Yeah. I was wondering why that character wasn't in it. I was like, wow, that's a key character. Like how could they not have him in it? And then, then when you see it at the end, you're like, Oh, okay. So there is potential, you know, the only character I didn't like that much was, and I didn't even like him in the first Mortal Kombat movie. I thought, they didn't do a well, good job casting him. I didn't like Raiden in the the character Raiden. He seemed like he didn't fit. Like his his like he he's this all powerful godlike character, displayed it at times and then was powerless at other times. Like I, it was a little confusing. Like like and he it, like the character himself didn't have like this big presence. It was like this kind of like so there's something about it that was just yeah, missing yeah. with that character. They were um, they were a little choosy with how they were going to reveal some of his powers i think in the beginning of the movie when he first appeared he was he looked like this all-powerful guy but then at the very end it was like okay like why couldn't couldn't he just he could probably just stop them all if he wanted to yeah and uh, and, and and he didn't so yeah. yeah i guess yeah i agree with that i i would agree with that he, he wasn't as as i guess powerful at times as as he should have been yeah um, and i and uh I liked, and I know Jarvis touched on this at the last po- time we talked about it. Is I liked how they built like there was this big feud between the Scorpion and Sub Zero. I thought that was like a nice twist to the story. I wish Scorpion came out more in the story. Like that 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 guy seemed like he was going to have a bigger role in the movie before he turned into Scorpion, but it just kind of just hovered yeah. around. And then you know at the end you get it, and so maybe he'll have a bigger role in the next movie. Yeah, you know what this movie actually felt like now after you watched it? 
it, it almost felt like a it was a prequel. You know, it's not really like the Mortal Kombat story. It's like the prequel. It's almost like their origin story. And now the next Mortal Kombat movie comes out. That's going to be like the real Mortal Kombat movie that everybody's like looking forward to. So, yeah, and I don't mind that. Like, you know, in, in this day and age, it's just it's all about sequels and making, you know, uh, see, like look at Marvel, like what Marvel has done. They build like a whole universe. They could do the same thing with Mortal Kombat. I mean, Scorpion and Sub-Zero, they can have their own standalone movies. Uh, you know, I mean, they could they could do so much around these characters because they've been around forever and, and a lot of people love them. And like the whole the whole nostalgic of of Mortal Kombat, some of the some of the sayings that they said that they kind of threw in there um, yeah. uh, throughout the movie were, were kind of fun in the way they the way they did it. So, yeah, I think, you know, overall, I thought it was a good movie. I, I don't understand why uh, some people hated it. I mean, you could see critics. Critics are always going to bash you know, all those type of movies, but even it from hearing it from like fans, some fans were like, Oh no, it was garbage. I hated it. Yeah. Like, oh, but the, I, I don't see it. Yeah. There's no, there's a lot of fans that complain about everything. Like they just, they basically want the video game and it's like, well, you can't do the video game. It's like people aren't going to sit for two hours. And I honestly thought they should have given it more time. Like there's a movie. If they could have done more character development, because some of them gained their powers relatively quickly. And I was like, Oh, you know what? I, that could have that kind of like was rushed i think just because they were on a, like a tighter time frame so i was like there's a movie if they went a little slower i would have been okay with it like them struggling to gain that kind of special power but whatever the best the best scene was um uh, what's his name, name kung lao when he <laughs> when he takes his hat and and basically oh, yeah. slices up the opponent and they yeah, made yeah. sure to make it like the video game as graphic as the, oh, and i'm yeah. like I'm like, that that's great. the game, you know? And I'm like, yeah. all right. And then they had the cheesy line at the end, which was like part of the, and I'm like, all right, what, they did a good what, job with it. What was it that he said after that? Was it flawless fatality? victory? Oh, flawless victory. I thought it was yeah. fatality. Fatality was another time. Yeah. yeah it was flawless victory. I was yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> he basically so awesome. just chopped around like, <laughs> so it was cool. I, I saw it. Yeah. I think people were hard on it. And I think you're right. I think you're building sort of like an origin story. Like this is where they started. I could have, if they sat with um, Scorpion, his fight scene at the beginning of the movie was so good. I if they kept his character going, and that was the story for most of the movie, I would have. That was actually really interesting. His feud with Sub Zero. I actually wanted to see more of that than a lot more of the Mortal Kombat. That could have been a whole movie by itself, like them battling till the end, like, and then I, all of a sudden, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, it exactly. Right, right. And I just, you know, the the big reveal, and, and this is for anybody who hasn't seen it, a little bit of a spoiler here, where it's like the baby in the beginning of the movie, where, you know, you're kind of going along the movie, and then you realize, who's the new character there? He wasn't from the video game, but he was kind of the main character. Cole? Cole? Cole um, Young? Yeah, Cole, Cole Young. Young. And, yeah. and he, he was the, um, um, I guess, the descendant, I guess, from from uh, uh, Scorpion. So, yes. so yeah. I, I, that seemed like it was just kind of a, a made up thing. That, I don't recall that ever being part of the video game or anything like that, right? I mean, it was just kind of something made up for the movie. But I didn't mind. I didn't mind. You know, you have to sometimes get a little bit creative and put something new in there as long as you still stick with the the general theme of Mortal Kombat and not go completely, you know, bonkers with uh with changing it all up you know yeah. so it's so it was good it was good i i you know looking forward to the second one oh uh, yeah i i'm with you in look it's a fun movie after a year of covid and a movie like this comes out just enjoy it it doesn't have to be like this like, like attention to every detail kind of movie look if you're gonna sit through kong and godzilla and not complain you know that's something you might, might want to complain about if this movie was more fun like it just you know, it just the they had to be creative. Yeah. You know, but if you if you were happy watching like two giant creatures battling it out for two hours straight or whatever how long the movie was and makes no sense and you didn't understand anything, watch that movie. But this movie was actually much better. And yeah, I would look forward to that sequel of Mortal Kombat versus another Kong and Godzilla sequel. Please. See, that would have that would have been better if they did fight for three hours throughout the movie, Kong and Go Godzilla. Like that actually would have made a better movie, but it was like they they fought bare at the end, like ten minutes. It was just it was so lame. It was don't don't get me started with Kong versus Godzilla. 
the, 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 the Kong and Godzilla scene where they were fighting in the ocean was probably the best part because that was kind of weird and cool. Like Kong yeah. had to like fight like in this like such a disadvantage, and he was trying to hold up his own. I thought that was pretty good, but the rest of the movie was kind of cheesy. But yeah, and then that actor from Stranger Things, whatever, her, awful. Um, awful, awful, awful. That's like she's basically the new good. the new Nicolas Cage, <laughs> the next generation of Keanu Reeves and Nicolas Cage acting. Like that's how Nicolas bad it was. Cage, that so, bad, huh? Yeah. She well, was bad. She was bad. No, in I'm, that I'm movie. Not, I, I, again, I like her in Stranger Things, but I think she's just not, she's not built for that. You know, and maybe she's a better actress. Maybe she's just, that was just the directing. I don't know. She, but. Didn't, she didn't talk. That's because yeah. she didn't talk as much in Stranger Things. That's why. Yeah. It's, it's your, it's your uh, you know, if you're not a good actor, like, uh, you know, let's say you could go back to Sylvester Stallone and some of the old. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Movies, Arnold yeah. Schwarzenegger. You could even say, yeah. um, Keanu Reeves, like there's like they just when he doesn't when they hey, don't Jarvis talk, is not here. We could say it. The Rock when the Rock isn't the talking, Rock, exactly. He, he makes good that. movies. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Just you just gotta look. You gotta have that like that brooding look, right? And just you know, just look like you're a badass, and that's it. Just don't yeah. say anything. Yeah, just I, I can't. Anything. I can't think of one of those type of guys that you want to hear any dialogue. It's like, like even in, like when he did Fast and the Furious, The Rock was good. When he wasn't talking, he was just acting. Like I, like I don't want to hear Vin Diesel talk. It's just not good. It's just like, it's all right. good, good segue into what I'm about to say next. Uh oh, go it's, ahead. It's it's great news, Azar. Great news. <laughs> oh, yes. Season Please. two of Young Rock just was re- <laughs> was renewed. The se- the Young Rock was just renewed for a second season. Can't wait. Can't all wait, right, because that we'll- first season was. Miserable. If, if so we're bad. gonna share for things that are forgettable, like <laughs> that, that, that's one that that's that should be forgettable. But I, I, I'm almost it's so bad. I actually want to watch it to see how really bad it ended up getting. How worse did it get? Um, but speaking of wrestling, you know, we didn't talk about this before we did the podcast, but I did want to touch on it. The new A and E W W E W Doc A E W. No, 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 no. The A and E channels. Oh, WWE. sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. AEW. Okay. No, no, no. Yes, the yes, WWE yes, yes. documentary is really well done. Really I watched. Good. I watched. Yes. The um, Roddy Piper was one of my favorite wrestlers. I loved his character growing up, and they, I thought they did such a good job of doing a lot of like flashbacks with videos. And in wrestling matches and things like like compared to the um, dark side of the ring, I feel like dark side of the ring. There's a lot of talking, but they only do like limited flashbacks, and you don't really get a full taste of it. But I thought with the A and E ones, they really make you remember his yeah. character and those times when he's in the Roddy Roddy Piper pit and like how he used to like get into fights with everybody. And when they showed that scene when Andre the Giant grabbed him by the throat and picked him up. And he was talking trash to him. I was like, I remember that as a kid. I remember that scene. And it was so yeah. good that they tied in so many flashbacks of him. I can't wait for the Macho Man one to come out. I am so excited to see that. I watched it. I watched the Macho Man. I thought they said it wasn't coming out until tomorrow. No, no. I watched it, uh, I watched it uh, the other night. Go Hulu. Ahead, so Hulu. I'm watching it um, on Hulu. And already um, the, like the playback mode. And it must be. You can't play, okay. watch it played back until the six. Maybe that must be okay. it. Because yeah, I was I like, watch, okay, go yeah, ahead. I'm I sorry. Watch it on, I watch it on Fubo. Fubo. So it's like that. That's I just have the re- the series recorded. So um, I didn't realize it was out until I was kind of flipping through my recordings, and I said, oh, Macho Man. Like, like I gotta watch this. And so I, I sat they drop on Sundays, movie. don't they? Aren't they on Sunday night? Uh, it was Sunday night, and I watched it on Monday night. Yeah. 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 See, that's why I was confused. Yeah. I was looking for it on Sunday. Because I was like, oh, I must have missed it. And then Hulu said, oh, available um, yeah. May 6th. And I'm like, oh, okay. I, I guess it must be coming down on May 6th. But that's good to know. Those are really well done. Yeah, they're really good. Then the difference between that and Dark Side of the Ring is Dark Side of the Ring focuses on the on the sob story. There's some there's some specific aspect that they want to talk about that's really like, you know, sad and tragic about that wrestler or, or something that's going on in the wrestling business. Whereas these are more of a true, and it's not what they're calling is, is a biography, right? There, it's a biography of that wrestler. So they really go from like the whole story from when they first got into wrestling into by the time they either died or retired or whatever. 
And um, so you kind of get a little bit of, of all the interesting aspects of it as opposed to just Dark Side of the Ring. They don't really get into the full character itself. Um, but the A&E one, what I've learned from watching now the Stone Cold one, uh, Roddy Piper, and now Macho Man, there is always something I, I didn't know before. I've learned something like new about all three of those that I did. I had no idea before. Huh. And even like video clips, just watching like old video clips, be like, Oh, I didn't know like this was his character before he got into the WWE or like the whole thing with like Roddy Piper coming in with the bagpipes and, you know, and like the whole story with him uh, down in Mexico yeah. saying he was going <laughs> to sing the national anthem. And it was the, he started playing uh, La Cucaracha, La Cucaracha and, <laughs> and just, and then not really knowing like how crazy some of these guys were, um, you know, throughout their, their lives. So yeah. Cause there was a, there was a dark side of the ring with macho man and Elizabeth. If you remember a few, a couple yeah. of seasons. Ago. Yeah, I did watch that. Yeah. And this one was with, so like they didn't have one of Roddy Piper. They didn't have one of stone cold. Steve so I couldn't compare those two, but I could compare it with this macho man one. And, and I got to say, there's a lot more content in this one than, than the one that, they had with dark side of the ring. Do you think because Vince McMahon is in it and they're interviewing him that maybe WWE released more background information for them than they did maybe for the dark side of the ring? Cause the dark side of the ring almost paints the wrestling is more of a negative light yeah. on them. And I wonder if Vince McMahon back, you know, he's very devious and I wonder if he backed this and said, we'll make these better and more mm. memorable. Because, and we'll give them more access to information than the dark side of the ring. Because I, I'm just wondering, because it just seems like these ones have a lot of information that, you're right, I didn't know, know a lot of it. I was like, huh, I'm kind of surprised that wasn't more public or something about this. Yeah. Thing. But anyways. Yeah, that's true. Maybe, maybe that's the case. I, I mean, but there were uh, WWE um, employees, if you will, with that were part of dark, dark side of the ring. So if it's McMahon yeah. was like, Hey, I don't want anybody in my business. Like, you know, being involved in any of these productions, then he wouldn't have let those guys go on dark side of the ring either. So, but That's you never true. saw Vince McMahon in those. So I, I don't know. I don't know what the, the, yeah. Cause there's some guys that I did see on dark side of the ring. were also talking in these documentaries, yeah, like executive That's... producers, like the guy, yeah. um, I, I forget his name. Um, but the heavy he was... set guy. Yeah, the guy that's always it's like he seems yeah, to be like, like almost he's every like, he's he's like their creative like writer like he's like their the head of of creative writer. Yeah. He was the guy that played Brother Love uh from uh from back in the the late 80s early 90s. If you remember Brother Love? Yeah. You know, the be like the red face and he came on he was like preaching. That was him. Yeah. That was him. So so it's uh it's kind of just funny that you see um you know now looking back cuz at the time when you were a kid watching these you're like, "All right, is this character whatever?" And then he disappears, and you're like, "All right, that guy's career is done." And then you later find out that he was like one of the top writers of of the entire company. This guy's like still with the company for 30, 40 years. So yeah, yeah, it's um, crazy. It's like well, Vince yeah. McMahon for forever. As a kid, I was like, "All right, he's just he's just some announcer. Like he's just like the color commentator, or whatever." And uh, come to find out, he actually owns the the entire <laughs> WWE. You're like, oh, I know. shit, he's a little he put, bit more important than I thought he was. And he put it all together, and. Um, so the the only thing I wanted to the last couple things from the the Roddy Piper documentary I I completely was I completely forgot about Lou Albano and when they brought up that whole Cindy I for, completely forgot about the whole Cindy Lauper saga and her role in that time and and then they brought in the Mr T like yeah. why they introduced Mr T uh, I just just going back and reliving all that stuff was just that was the great thing about what they did in this a and is just bringing back. And then Sergeant Slaughter was in it. And I was like, man, I haven't seen him forever. And the fact that you were able to get him and do a, share some commentary on it. And so that's, that's what was kind of cool is it really brought you back. Oh yeah. Of wrestling. Yeah. yeah. And that was, that was the whole, like that, that's what kickstarted the whole mainstream. That's what they, that's what they call like the rock and wrestling, right? They, they invited, they brought rock, uh, not the rock, <laughs> That's yeah, young rock, but mm -hmm. rock and roll into with wrestling, and they were able to kind of partner up together to really expand their audience. And I mean, it was brilliant. It was brilliant how they did it, and it just turned into like this little wrestling thing into more mainstream. 
And uh, to look back now, like Cindy Lauper, of all people, and yeah. Mr. T. And Roddy Piper was like right in the middle of it, right? Because he was he was playing like the villain throughout this whole the whole the whole thing. So it all just kind of worked out, and that's what that's what really created it to, to explode the way it did. So yeah, no, absolutely. And and the last thing on that um, was it was so cool that they had um, Roddy Piper's notes from all his catchphrases, all of his lines, and they were sh- and they were going back and forth, showing the interview, like saying, like showing him when he was doing his interviews in WWF, and then they will just kind of highlight, like he wrote all that, he, like he he put in a lot, it wasn't off the cuff, it was all planned, he put a lot of work into it, and you just don't appreciate it until you see that and say, man, he really worked at this. Yeah. It wasn't just some kind of, he was the best. I think of all the wrestlers of all, he was the best on the mic. Yeah. He was the best. Like you could throw a mic at him and he could just, he could go off and it would just be entertaining as hell. The best trash talker. And you, and it's sad because I, I've seen people try to reproduce what he did years later and it was never the same. They could never capture what Roddy Piper mm. was able to capture mm. off that microphone. Uh, so By some of it that. was just cheesy. Good. He just, he did it in a way that it didn't feel cheesy. It was like so... Yeah. I thought he was believable, and of course he did go into acting there for a little bit. He was in a couple of I, movies, but I forgot about that. <laughs> but but he, he was a good actor. Like he he made he was believable in what yeah. he was saying. It's like you really truly like wanted to hate him. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and the Macho Man's very much the same way. He had a very similar thing with him, where it's like he was just so believable. When you watch this, you'll see how much actually he was hated uh, by fans, and just just because he played such a good bad guy. So yeah. the next one uh, after this, they say it's uh, Booker T. I'm not as excited about Booker T as the first three because Booker T was just, he, he he came into WWE later on. He was a bigger star, I think either in WCW or ECW. This is, I forget exactly which one it was. This is where we need we need Jarvis to, to confirm with, with one of those two. But I didn't watch those when I was younger. It was just all WWE or WWF at the time. Yeah. And then by the time Booker T was in WWF, that's when I kind of stopped watching it. So I don't know if I'm as excited, but I'll end up watching it anyway because they're they're so well done. These biography shows are, are so well done. So I'll yeah. have to watch it. So yeah, and, and they must be working on a Bret Hart one, like a more detailed Bret Hart one. I would imagine, yeah. right? I mean, he seems to be in a lot of the interviews. Um, yeah. So I, hopefully they are pulling him in. Yeah, so that was great. I'm looking forward to the Macho Man. And uh, so if you haven't seen it, it's on A&E. I believe, <laughs> Big Me and I, you know, we don't have regular cable. So if you have regular cable, it's on A&E. It should be de- on available at um, Sunday nights. Try to, you got to watch it. If you loved wrestling back in the day, you got to go back and watch those. So the only other thing um, on news, and we'll talk about the Falcon and Winter Soldier, Big Me, is I heard the rumor, which... Um, Gina Carano, who got fired from The Mandalorian, there's a rumor. She played Cara Dune, if you guys did not know who she played. There's a rumor that Disney and her are talking back and actually now talking about bringing her back mm-hmm. into the show. There's like some, they made peace with each other on the whole, you know, yeah, I think, I, and I think that's fan blowback for getting rid of her. And because fans really liked her. So Disney's kind of like realizing they might have overreacted by firing oh, her yeah. prematurely so oh absolutely yeah i've heard the same uh, same rumor about that yeah and actually i i don't really i didn't really care that much about her character but i i she feels like she's part of the show now and just to kind of abruptly cut her out i hate yeah. that with you know like you, I, I even if you don't agree with them like as long as they do their job professionally just leave them alone and keep them in the show like that's how i feel about it like who cares what their politics are or what they do just focus on are they doing their job is she likable? Leave it alone. So right. <laughs> that's right. just right. my thought. I mean, on. I guess unless she does something like, or or, or anybody does something really, um, she goes like full really, Roseanne. You know, yeah, like she like, does yeah, something exactly like, like full but Roseanne. What she did was was not that was not that bad. I just don't see what she and she was trying to like come out and defend it and say no, no, this is what I meant. And it was like nope, nope, we don't want to hear it. Too bad you're fired. And it was just like, yeah. come on, it, was, it definitely was a little bit premature. And so. Uh, it could have been. It could have just been after she was fired that all the the Cara Dune uh, merchandise and all the action figures were flying off the shelf. Everybody yeah. was running out to buy all those. Dizzy was probably thinking like, 
holy crap, like we made a fortune just off of Kara doing merchandise. It's like, we got to bring her back now so we can sell even more merchandise. Yeah. So yeah, it's, 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 it's like, oh no, it's like what you said is offensive until we start losing money. And then it's like, oh no, no, no. All right. Now you can yeah. come back. No, no, yeah. all is well. It's fine. Yeah. Well, in, 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 in her, and the last point on her is she got screwed because her, the leading star of the show said more offensive things technically yeah. on the topic that they were like, what she was referencing. I won't go into it, but his was more offensive than what she said. And they're like, they let him slide in with her. They're like, no, no, we're going to fire you. And it's like, come on. Like this just, you can't play those games with people. It just, it just pisses fans off. Okay. Um, so speaking of pissing people off, <laughs> I don't get it. Like everybody's feedback is people love, love the Falcon and winter soldier. <laughs> Am I missing something? Do uh, I? Can't, I couldn't walk away from that show saying I really liked it. It was it was good, but it was you left kind of like, eh, a little disappointed. Yeah, it was it was disappointing. I mean, I think there. I think the the ones that do like it see past a little bit more of like the political agenda that they were trying to push, and it's like I don't really care about any of that stuff, but. At the end of the day, if it's a good story and there's some good action, and it's like, whatever. Like, I'll enjoy it just as much as I enjoy any of the other Marvel shows and movies. But this one just seemed a little dull. And the story just, there wasn't a strong storyline. It kept jumping back and forth. And then I said, going into the last episode, I said, all right, well, as long as there's, like, all action and it just ends up being great. And there was obviously more action. You you have come to expect that. But it still didn't. It still, I, it didn't end the way I wasn't pleased with how how it all ended, you know. And then like the 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 John Walker character, right? The new Captain America. It was like he was bad, then he was good, and then he was just kind of like a side character at some point. And it was, it didn't even seem like it made sense that he was even there. And it just, it, it was all just kind of didn't, it didn't make a lot of sense to me in terms of just the, the storyline. So. Um, I agree. I, I, agree. I wasn't a big I, fan of it. wasn't a big fan, but it was it was okay. It was it wasn't like it wasn't Wonder Woman 1984 bad, but it no, was no. just it yeah. was just okay. It, it, it so the new Captain America. We thought he was going to be a good villain. Like we're like, oh, he's going to be like this bad villain now. He's going to he's going to add to the story. Nope. He they, it seems like they had no real direction for him. He was either good. Or he was bad. He ends up being buddies with them at the end, and it's like, okay. I still don't understand what Julia Lewis Dreyfus's role, what her character like. They kind of left that, and even that, they could have built that up more, like something more sinister or something to kind of want. But they kind of like just introduced it, and like she was like kind of passive on it, and it was like, okay, well, what does this all mean? Like, are we gonna have to wait till uh, like a Marvel movie to understand her role in this whole thing? Like, uh, it's so. That was the only intriguing thing that I walked away with. I didn't get the villains that they were. What are they called? Uh, the flag busters. The flag smashers. Flag smashers. Like they were the most. He would love it. He was the most boring villain. Yeah. Like there was nothing about oh. them that was like like she was yeah. apologizing. Like I didn't kill. I'm like, are you evil? Are you powerful? Like what are you doing? Like. Yeah. So I think that's what it was to me. Is like this. I think you said it. Is that the story didn't wasn't an exciting story, mm-hmm. and a good story needs a good villain. You want to hate the villain. You want them to get their their thing at the end, like their punishment at the end. And it had none of that. It was just like they were back on the boat. They're back on the boat again at the end. They wrapped the whole damn show with them on the boat. Him and Bucky on the boat. Yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> and his sister, <laughs> and his sister. So he's now the first black Captain America. And and his sequel is or how they wrap the movie is he's on a boat with his sister, partying. And I'm like, mm-hmm. couldn't you have him fighting, like showing him like being a superhero or something? Yeah, yeah. Beyond, well, like... you know, uh, there's they they've already announced Captain America four. Okay, and he's going to be the new Captain America in the next Captain which is America fine. movie. Yeah, which is fine too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and then they follow a lot about what the comics uh, went through, but it just seemed like the story was just discombobulated to me. You know, yeah. just nothing really flowed that well. I still think Bucky came off as kind of like this this weak character. He was almost like a sidekick, side character. This guy was, you know, been, a, been around since uh, the first Captain America movie. And he was 
he was kind of a main character then when Winter Soldier came out. It was like he was they were building his character up to be this this huge character in the Marvel universe, and yeah. this came out and it was like he's just yeah. kind of there, like just whatever. He's got the metal arm. And he's the muscle. It was like he was the muscle. That that's all he was. It is yeah, and un, an unreliable muscle. Like you couldn't even tell when he could hand, like at least at the ending, he seemed like he was back to his powerful self. But again, it just it fell flat. And and maybe this was their weird origin story, how he's the new Captain America. So now they can make a movie. Like it just kind of helps transition to them making a Captain America four. But yeah. Well, like I said, uh, uh, a few podcasts ago, it, it's in, in from everything that I've read. Um, this series has like paved the way for a whole bunch of new shows and new movies. So like the Julia Lewis Dreyfus character, she seems like she's going to be some main villain in a future movie. Uh, who is it? The Sharon Carter character. She's going to kind of go off and do her own thing. Uh, Zemo with like in Wakanda now, like there, you know, once, so like it's all these little side stories that have kind of branched off and are going to start being more touched on in, in future, future movies and, and future Disney plus shows. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and it just seemed like they, they used this show as that opportunity to say, okay, let's try to, start some new storylines here and they could just start branching out and we don't have to explain all that much in future movies and shows. We could just get right into it. Yeah. Um, but you know, if that was their intention, then they, uh, they swung and miss. They swung yeah. and miss with this one. Yeah. yeah. It just, it's, I don't know. Well, we'll see. I, I'm actually looking forward to Loki because I like the character. I like the actor that does it. Um, I'm hoping there is a little bit more excitement in something about that show. And I think Loki is that lovable villain. Like you, you want to hate him, you like him. So I think he's already got that villain character kind of locked up because he does such a good job at, you know, you don't know if you want to hate him or like him kind of character. So I'm going to, I'm going to like, I think I'm going to like that one. I'm going to like yeah. that one much more than this one. And I did hear it's uh, they're releasing it two days earlier than, uh, than they originally planned. So it's still is it a month of- away. June, right? Still a month away, but it's like, yeah. What is it? June or, or end of May? I thought it was June, but I, we can double check that. Well, if we... Anyway, they did they did announce just today or yesterday that they uh, are doing a uh, two days earlier release on it. So that's awesome. Okay, yeah. sooner the better. Yeah, yeah. We need we, we need we need our our Disney Plus content. Yeah, I know it's it's funny because. I haven't been on it since the, the Falcon and Winter Soldier. I just I, I keep going back to HBO Max to watch and things. Um, they just have much. They just have much more interesting things on it for me. Yeah, June eleventh. Uh, June eleventh. Yeah, is that's it. what I thought. June. That's great. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, all right. Speaking of things to looking forward to and excitement of characters that are, you know, starting a new. What do we want to call it? Uh, a new future for us to follow and watch is uh, the NFL draft last week. Big me. I'm, I'm here. I'm ready to jump into it. Let you take your victory lap. Uh, you called uh, it. You've been calling it for months. Uh, you, I, I got to give you guys credit. You, you and Jarvis called the draft. I mean, I know we were using a mock draft to kind of use as a guide, but a lot of it kind of went, you know, some changes and surprises, but you guys called some of the, some of the um, picks pretty well and some of them you guys were just slightly off but the, you guys weren't terribly off you were slightly off on some but the biggest one to give you credit is you said you were convinced they were going to get mac jones no matter what that was their pick and you stuck with it before the draft and at the draft you were, were rewarded by belichick I, I stuck i stuck that's right belichick listens to our podcast that's yeah. why he was <laughs> listening and he said you know what big meat has a point it's like why ain't why aren't i not drafting mac jones so that's what they went with. Um, yeah, I've been saying, you go back to the, 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 the first podcast when I first mentioned his name. It was, it was late January. It was like whatever, January 27th. That was before the Senior Bowl. That was before anybody was even talking about Mac Jones. And I mentioned it. I said, hey, why not Mac Jones? He seems like he'd be a, a great fit for the Patriots. And every week, I never, I never wavered. I said, Mac Jones, Mac It was only when... San Fran moved up to third overall, and there was all this talk about them getting Mac Jones. I said, oh, all right, well, there's nothing the Patriots can do at this point now. If they take him, then he's gone. But if they don't take him, I'm convinced he's going to slide to 15. And that's exactly what happened. They went with Trey Lance, who I said who they were going to take. And um, 
And then, and then I said, okay, unless maybe somebody moves up and the Chicago bears did move up, which was a little bit uh, surprising, right? When they moved up, I said, Oh, they need a quarterback. I said, could this be Mac Jones? Nope. Well, and Justin Fields was there. So they got Justin Fields. And I said, all right. Now, once, once they got Justin Fields, it was a 100% guarantee. I would have, I would have put tons of money on it that Mac Jones was going to be drafted by the Patriots. Now I was surprised because I just didn't think Mac Jones was going to keep dropping in the draft as far as he did. I just felt at some point, some either someone was going to trade in to the top 10. Um, I really thought the Broncos, once I started seeing Mac Jones and Fields sliding, I really thought the Broncos would have jumped on that opportunity to take a quarterback in that, in that situation, but they didn't. And then all of a sudden Fields, when the Bears went in, I was like, oh, geez, I wonder who they're going to take. It took Fields. Then, like, and then you knew, like, after the Bears passed on Mac Jones, you almost you're like, okay, he's going to the Patriots. Like, he's he's going to be an option for Belichick. But there was always that little bit of fear: was Jarvis going to be right? Was Belichick really going to pass on a quarterback out of pure stubbornness? And he didn't. He actually pulled the trigger. Now you can have the Felger takes that are out there that, or all the now the talk, all the talking heads are saying. You know, Belichick really didn't want Mac Jones. He took him reluctantly. Like, he didn't care if he was there because he didn't he didn't trade away picks to get him sooner. And I'm like, well, if he didn't have to trade away picks, I don't understand. Didn't he do the right thing? He didn't have to give up and he got what he wanted? Or, like, it, it, it's a little confusing. People just want to hate for the sake of hating. I'm just, I'm perplexed by the hate sometimes <laughs> that people want to dish out. You know what, though? That's just, that's just radio guys trying to stir up controversy. So if, if Jarvis was here, I'm sure he'd be doing the same thing, stirring yeah. up some controversy. <laughs> it, and this is, this is a guy that was the, the right fit for the Patriots. He went to his pro day. He was hanging out with Nick Saban throughout the whole time. I was just watching Mac Jones, you know, go through his drills. Um, all the talk, like Charlie Weiss coming out saying like, oh, Mac Jones might be a, would be a great fit for the Patriots. Like everything that you've read about Tom Brady, and I know it's it's hard to compare, right? And it's not fair for somebody like Mac Jones to come in and say, geez, you know, if I don't if I don't become the next Tom Brady, does that mean I'm a failure here? It's going to be, it's, you can't compare him to Tom Brady. I'm just comparing him to what people were saying about Tom Brady in the Patriots system. And if, if it worked for Tom Brady, it might not be, it might take a year or two, maybe even three years down the road. And <laughs> until then we're going to have to suffer with, with Cam Newton. But I think it was the right pick. I think this is the right, the right pick for the Patriots to take him. They needed a quarterback. He was the last of the bunch that was available. And in fact, if we were going to pick any one of them, I still, I still like the fact that it was Mac Jones over Justin Fields or Trey Lance or Zach Wilson, maybe not Trevor Lawrence, but he wasn't, he wasn't going to end up. He was never you know, an option. He, he, yeah. he was never an option. Exactly. So, um, so I'm glad it was Mac Jones. You know, if uh, the Patriots were moved up like San Fran did and they have the number three overall pick and they took Mac Jones there, I would have been happy. I would have been happy with them taking Mac Jones at that point as well. So I think they, I think they, uh, knocked the ball out of the park, this, this draft, taking him. And then in rounds two and three, getting two guys that were projected to be, some of them were projected to be first round guys. Even as like, you could even say like middle second round. And he got them after what they were, they were supposed to go, which you never saw Belichick do that all that often, right? He's always drafting guys where like, Oh, who is this guy? You never even heard of this guy. Or, you know, he's picking somebody from a division three college or he's trading down or it's, he never takes the guys that were projected by some mock drafts as going higher and Belichick swooping in and taking them. So um, can't blame him for, for taking those guys. I didn't think they needed a defensive tackle, but where he was at that point in round two, he took them and it was, it was a great value pick for him. Yeah. I like the depth. Uh, and it, we saw the last couple of picks, there was a focus on defense there. And that's what I, I thought that's what their focus would be through the whole draft. I thought the quarterbacks would have, not have been an option for Belichick and he would have put his attention in defensive players. And it was nice to see. I liked the defensive picks. I, I actually, and again, I think there was a big question was the whole cornerback situation, what they're going to do with their corners. I think they're going to resolve the cornerback situation, at least for this year. And then maybe worry about it in free agency next year or, you know, pick up people in the draft next year. But I feel this year, I think I'm really confident and really, bullish on the 
the Patriots defense this coming year. I think they're going to have a solid defense. They have some of their old pieces back um, that are going to add to some of the holes that they were having last year. So I don't think they're going to be as easy to run on in 2021 as they were last year. I think, and they weren't even a bad defense last year. It's just, they, they were kind of porous in the run and uh, up the middle. Right. So I think they made some great moves. I, I just, and, yeah. Anyway. And their offense was so bad too, that, that their defense was on the field a lot. Yeah. So and, and go uh, figure how well their defense did, despite how bad Cam Newton was and how bad that offense was. They, I mean, they were on the field a lot, like grinding just to, you know, so, you, you know, just because we're on this topic, if I could just like run through, cause I, cause I heard, uh, uh, or I read an article uh, yesterday on just kind of the general Patriots defense. And it made me think about their defense as a whole, because I forgot about one or two of those guys on the defense. Um, if I could just run through who the projected yeah. starters are. So on the defensive line, right? Lawrence guy, is one of the defensive ends. He's the left defensive end. He's not bad. Um, the guy that they just picked up uh, in free agency, uh, Devon uh, Godcho, <laughs> or Godchuck, oh, that's the way. Yeah. He, he's their nose tackle. Um, and they also have Dietrich Wise, who you know is not a bad player as well. And then the guy that they that they're big free agent signing in Matt Judon. That's a pretty solid defensive line. Um, they have a couple other guys like Henry Anderson. Well, the guy that they just drafted, Christian Barmore, he's, you know, to add in there for, for some for some depth. Um, Josh uh, Uche, who was a, I think he was the rookie last year. So he's just kind of a young guy. But their defensive line is in good shape. You go to the linebackers, Jawan Bentley, he was uh, he was a decent player for them last year. Dante High, Hightower is now back. Sure, yeah, he's a little okay. older, but he's the captain of the defense. Kyle yeah. Van Noy, who they just got in free agency, uh, they got him back. So... You know, that's a solid three linebackers there. And I'm not even mentioning Chase Winovich, who I think is going to be, you know, a rising star. I think he's going to end up starting a lot of those games when there's an injury uh, to one of the linebackers there. Um, then you go to the secondary, J.C. Jackson, Devin McCourty, Stephon Gilmore. And, of course, they picked up Jalen Mills. Uh, he's he's the other guy that uh, could end up being a starter, but he's probably going to end up being a, a, um, a backup here at some point. Kyle Duggar. But I forgot about Adrian Phillips. Adrian Phillips was the guy that they picked up two seasons ago, and he was their strong safety. So I forgot that I forgot all about that guy. I thought it was going to be just Jalen Mills being thrown in there at safety. But this depth chart that I'm seeing here, they have Adrian Phillips as the starter and Jalen Mills as the free safety backing up De Devin McCourty. So like I said, they're solid all throughout their starting lineup, and they have a little bit of depth to go with it. So I think they're going to be. I think they're going to be terrific uh, on defense. I would say I would go as far as saying top three defense in the league. That's how that's how strong they are. Maybe not the best. That's that's kind of hard to say because uh, there's still a couple of other good defenses that are out there. But I think top three. I think they'll be right there in the mix. So because we're more of a fantasy podcast, do you, would you take them in, as a top three? When you say that as a top three draft, like defense to go off the board on draft day i think so sure both 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 in fantasy and both because they're not going to okay. give up i don't think they're going to give up a lot of points and you know they do have some guys that that now could could rack up some of those sacks and rack up some of those interceptions as well so you're going to see you know the turnover battle there they're going to be winning a lot of those battles so i think at the end of the year you're going to look at them as one of the better defenses in the league both in nfl standards and also as in fantasy as well because of all those uh, all those sacks and all those turnovers. Now, let me play from a fantasy perspective. I would say if we find from Belichick that it looks like Cam Newton is the starter and we get to see some of the preseason games and maybe Mac Jones still needs some development. I don't know. I did. I, I'd have to, there might be some slight hesitation. I would have to do a double check to make sure that I'm a hundred percent convinced. I want to take the chance on the Patriots. Cause if, because, again, what happened last year, if Cam Newton's turning over the ball, putting the defense in bad positions, mm -hmm. you know, an easy scoring, you know, defense can only do so much to keep someone from scoring. And I think that's the great thing about the pass defense. They always can keep someone from scoring a touchdown. But if, if Cam Newton's turning over the ball near the goal line, there's always field goal. There's points being racked up against them. Now, it might not be high. I, I don't know. I think you're right. I think defense is going to be that good. But I just, the Cam Newton X factor if preseason's telling me and then I'm on draft day and I have to choose between the Rams or the Patriots, I'll be like, Ugh, I don't know. Like, 
like who do I want to go with? Who do I trust yeah. more? Um, just because the not the defense problem, the Cam Newton X factor scares me. Right. Just, that's true. That that is true. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that is. I would say that is that is definitely a factor there. I'm just hoping that they are committed to the run more where they're just becoming a, a ground and pound team, not focusing if Kim Newton's the guy that they're not focusing on him throwing the ball all that much. I know you have to mix it in. You have to have a little bit of balance. You can't be predictable on offense, but if they can, if they have a successful running game and, you know, and, and they try to keep the, 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 the defense off the field that way, and they just kill the clock, kill the clock, kill the clock, then, you know, that's that's just as good as, as having a, a potent offense where they're going up, scoring a ton of points. And and now the other def- – the other when they're when the defense is on the field and the other offense is trying to score, now you know it's a little bit more predictable where they're like, all right, they just scored, you know, three touchdowns and it's still the first quarter. Now we've got to throw to come back. Obviously, the defense knows they're going to throw and you just kind of limit their offense. I don't think you're going to see that all that much. You're not going to see Cam Newton. They're not going to score. You know, they're not going to. These, this isn't the 2007 Patriots. I think you're going to see a little bit more of a grinding game. But all the same, because it's going to keep that defense a little bit off the field. So that's yeah. that's at least what I'm hoping. But it is it is a concern with Cam Newton because if yeah. he starts turning the ball over, there's nothing you can do about that. Now you know it's interesting because the, in the news, if people didn't hear is Sony Michel is not getting his fifth year option picked up by the Patriots. Thank God. Does that put a fire under Sony's ass for a contract for the next year? Will he finally get that other gear that's been always inconsistent with them? Like he always seems to like sometimes he has these flashes that you're like, oh you know what he could be a good back if he wants to be. Then he does like that Lawrence Maroney dance and he just fades into like he just doesn't do anything. So I'm wondering if this knowing that he's not getting re-signed Will he give it a hundred percent? And you know, I don't think they'll change the Patriots to sign him, but maybe he'll give a hundred percent because he wants to get paid the following year by somebody, right? He's got to, he's got to sure. look good. Or do you think he's going to get cut? Um, no, I don't think he's going to get cut because because for them, he's still not getting paid all that much money, and I think they didn't renew his his deal uh, for the fifth year option because then he would get paid a lot of money on that fifth year. I think it was like close to 5 million bucks. Yeah. And they're just looking at it. Like we don't need this guy. We have, we have Damian Harris. We have, um, uh, we have James white. We just drafted a guy, Ramondre. I, I had to look up his name to make sure I'm, I'm pronouncing it right. Ramondre Stevenson. Who's a like a Garrett bruiser. blunt, kind yeah. of, like Garrett blunt kind of guy. And it's like, well, why do we need, why do we need uh Sony Michelle anymore? It's running backs, especially in the Belichick's, system they don't last very long (laughs) you know it's like he's every year it seems like he drafts a running back and i wouldn't be surprised if a year or two from now damian harris is is out the door as successful as he might be in the next couple years and it's the next guy up and it's like they just do not last very long in this system so i'm not surprised i think sony michelle is just going to be you know he'll he'll sign with another team at some point and then he'll he'll fizzle out in the next two or three years and you know, never to be heard from again. The typical, again, going back to fantasy, the Belichick trap is every time you feel like your guy's got the role, like like we're going into the season, we're like, oh, Damian Harris has got to be the starter, right? We're, we're convinced he's the starter. And every time you do that and you draft him high, Belichick still loves the damn committee thing. It, yeah. it, would, it, would it surprise you, like, in a game, if Sony Michelle gets more carries than Damian Harris and all of a sudden, like, in one game, you'd be like, what are we doing? Like, why are you not giving the ball? Like, that's just like the Belichick way to frustrate you. Like, you, you can never plan. And then maybe he does it on purpose for so defenses can't plan around him. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, like what you can't just say, assume Damian Harris is going to get the ball all the time. Because all of a sudden there's games where James White gets more looks and more touches than anybody else. Or Rex Burkhead comes yeah. out of nowhere. Or, you know, there's all these characters that he throws in sometimes. Cordell Patterson was getting more look, carries in yeah. some games. And you're like, what, what are we doing? So I still... From a fantasy perspective, I'm still nervous to draft someone like Damian Harris. I, no. I just I've seen it so many times with the Patriots. I just don't know how you can trust yeah. it. And and you and you and you'll regret it because there'll be some games Damian Harrison goes off, he scores a bunch of touchdowns, and you're like, Oh, I should have drafted him. But by oh, the end yeah. of the season <laughs> Yeah, you're right. And you also have the Cam Newton factor as well. Once you get close to the end zone, it's him just yeah. punching it in. He had twelve touchdowns last year. So 
Um, <laughs> you know, throw that all together and and don't forget the tight end. This- the Jonah Smith and, the tight ends, and exactly. Are yeah. are you really going to be running it in when you have two big physical tight ends? Yeah, that could yeah. be like go back to the Gronk days. Like that just took a lot of carries from the backs. Like it was why run it in when you could just yeah. you know, and, let and, Jonah Smith physically just outmatch true. somebody. So yeah, there was one. Uh, I think there was a play, not a whole different thing, but you know, Jonah Smith had a, a rushing touchdown. Uh, for Tennessee last year, I remember he was like on a sweep play, and he ended up like getting it and running it in. I, yeah. I said, if that's what, if that's in his uh, is his repertoire, then uh, then maybe that's what they want to use him for too. You like that word, huh? He's, yeah, uh, I like it. You know, like that repertoire. <laughs> uh, I, by the way, another reason why I also liked uh, Mac Jones, the Mac Jones pick, is that he played with Damian Harris at Alabama. So it'll be a little bit of the quarterback running back connection there, you know, not, not a receiver connection, but a running back connection, which, yeah. you know, works for me. It works for me. I, I, cause there was a lot of, um, a lot, obviously a lot of the Boston radio shows had a lot of guests. There was a lot of focus on the Mac Jones pick. They actually had Mac Jones trainer, um, talk about, um, I don't know if it's his personal coach or personal trainer. I couldn't make sense of, it was some guy that helped develop, Mac Jones and his, his, um, he talked about his technique and he said it, it was a comment that was made about the one thing that's great about Mac Jones is he can hit someone like Jonu Smith, who's so good in stride. Like he can, he has such a touch and accuracy that, you know, he's not the most gifted athletically or physically like to outrun anybody. But if you want someone that can hit someone like Jonu Smith, you know, going down a deep route and just get it perfectly where it needs to be and let someone physical like Jonas Smith get the ball. He is the perfect quarterback for that. And I was like, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Like if you're going to invest in the weapons, like Henry and Jonas Smith and some, our receiving core is still, I'd say it's still kind of weak. I don't think we have a true number one. That's the problem. No, no, no. We're, we're, they, they have a bunch of number, you know, end of the pack number twos and number threes. That's what they have. Yeah. You know, Nelson Algalore, the guy born that they got, Jacoby Myers, you know, uh, Nikhil Harry, <laughs> your, your, your boy. You yeah. know, these guys, maybe one of them emerges now with, with again, if it's if it's Cam, God help us all. But, <laughs> but if it's Mac Jones, maybe those guys have a chance. But it is, but it is right about Mac Jones is, is that of all the quarterbacks in this draft, he was the most, he was touted as the most accurate throwing the ball between um, zero and like 15 yards, something like that. It was like, you know, within zero and 15 yards in that, in that space right there, he was the most accurate quarterback. Can he throw an accurate deep ball? He doesn't have the arm strength to do that. Not like some of the other guys, Justin Fields and Trey Lance, they have like rockets for arms. He, he's not going to do that, but that was never, that was never in, in, in the Patriots style of offense. You know, once in a while you throw a deep just for, you know, keep the defense honest, but that's, that's not their, that's, that was never their offensive game plan. That's why I thought Mac Jones was perfect. They want, he needs a smart, um, uh, accurate quarterback that can hit those guys in stride and throw it to the running back. That's, that's like the exact opposite of what Cam Newton is capable of doing. That's why I just don't see Cam Newton ever working out here. Uh, yeah, I agree. Patriots. I agree. Let's hope. Let's hope. And, you know, we make a, I mean, you can make a big deal that they don't have a true number one receiver. But if, if Jonu Smith is as good of a receiver as he can be from that, and he's not necessarily going to always line up as a tight end, that he might be your number one receiver. Just because he's mm-hmm. labeled a tight end doesn't mean that he can't be the number one you know, catcher. You, don't think Hunter, you, think, you think more so than Hunter Henry? Well, that's what I mean. Like, you have both of them. I don't know. Like, I just know that, like, there's a lot of hype around Jonu Smith physically. Like, he's, like, this gifted. Yeah. I think he, like, at least from what I've heard, it seems like Jonu Smith is more gifted as an athlete, yeah, he's a monster. Yeah. Than Hunter Henry, so Hunter, and again, that's the other thing is, so those are your one and two receivers, and then you have your your number twos, right, or three, right? like who cares about those yeah. other guys, right? At yeah. the end of the day, you got you have you have some number potentially number one receivers, but not you know, your I, prototypic number ones, you know. But now, now I, I know uh, I know Jarvis makes fun of Aguilar. Would you call him brick hands or whatever? Yeah. He's always like dropping pad. I just remember Aguilar the last couple of seasons. Yeah, you know, I don't watch a lot of Philadelphia Eagles games, but but watching like ESPN highlights or whatever when they came and they said, 
oh, there's Algalore running down the field, like long pass, catch, and touchdown. He seemed like he was an explosive receiver at times. It's like when you needed that big play, he was there. And maybe that's just what you're going to see. He's probably not going to catch a lot of passes, probably, probably be in like the 50 reception range, right? Maybe not even a lot of yards, but he's going to have that long um, uh, yards per catch. You know what I mean? He's going to have like, it's going to be like 20 yards per catch uh, uh, percentage or whatever that he's going to end up having. And I see him having those like one or big, one or two big plays here and there. That's going to help them score that quick touchdown. I think he's capable of doing that because I've seen enough plays of him doing that when he was with, when he was with. Yeah. No, so the only thing that I've, I I had him in like fantasy, this is from a fantasy perspective, just watching him, having him on my team as a fantasy, um, Few, some weeks the problem with Al- Algalore is if he's playing a good cornerback he just disappears like he just he doesn't have that ability to separate I, I don't know if it's his route running his speed I don't know what it is but if he's against a good defensive back he just all of a sudden disappears but if he's in a matchup that's favorable to him you're right he's he gets these explosive games mm-hmm. now the good thing about the Patriots is you're not asking him to be a number one like sometimes the Raiders were and sometimes the Eagles were because of injuries. They're, like Aguilar ended up being their number one. On the Patriots, yeah. he isn't a number one. So maybe that gives him that advantage to be more explosive. He's not going to get double teamed. Sure. He's not going to just disappear because you can't. There's too many other options the Patriots have to worry about when you're in the defense. So that's the only hope we have is that maybe he can exploit some defenses because uh, he's not going to get all the full attention. Mm-hmm. Um, that's wishful thinking. <laughs> but again, watching him, that was the only problem with him is that, you know, one week you're chasing points. Like one week he'll have a monster week. You keep him in your lineup the following week, and he just does nothing. That um, reminds me of um, of uh, lo- uh, Lockett. Yeah. <laughs> Tyler Lockett. Yeah. yeah. That guy, like, had these big three touchdown games, and – you you were right about him last year because there were games there where I was like, oh, this guy's just unstoppable, and then he just disappears for weeks. We I don't think he I don't think he topped like fifty yards in the second half of last season receiving yards. It just I kept throwing him out there at fantasy like, oh, just he's gonna have that three touchdown game again, and it's like it never came close to that, and yeah. it was it was maddening. It was so maddening with that guy. Hopefully we don't see that. Hopefully it's not that inconsistent. With, no, um, I, I don't think so. I, I think that the, the Lockett games are when Metcalf came, is just getting covered like crazy. I think Wilson likes going to Metcalf first. And then yeah. the games when he just can't go to him, Russell Wilson isn't stupid. He doesn't force the ball. He'll just – he uses Lockett and just exploits him. But that means the next week is you, you're like, oh, well, you know, he's locked in with Wilson. No, Wilson doesn't want to go back to him. He's going to go back to DK Metcalf. He's yeah, a much sexier true. Um, yes. piece of equipment to throw yes. to. So, yes. <laughs> which yes. I did read somewhere, and I don't know if it was bar stools or someone posted it that DK Metcalf is going to compete or try out for the Olympics. Yeah, yeah, for uh, <laughs> one of the track and field yeah, uh, I, events. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, he, he's. I actually like DK Metcalf. I mean, yeah. Uh, Ever uh, since he ran down that uh, the interception return there, yeah, yeah, yeah ran ran a foot, caught up to him. And yeah. the, the guy was like, like, oh, I'm going to walk in. And here comes DK Metcalf running like the best full play field. of last year. Best play. Oh, he, that was awesome. Insane. By the way, I do have to correct myself because I know I'm going to get a lot of, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, hate mail because of this. Um, Aguilar played for the Raiders last year. Before yes. last year, he played for the Eagles. I said the Philadelphia Eagles. I said I haven't watched a lot of Eagles games. I didn't watch a lot of Raiders games either. <laughs> That's why I didn't. Oh, know. okay. Yeah. It's on the Raiders. Yeah. 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 Right. But it was with the Raiders last year is where he had, you know, an His average year. of 18.7, 18.7 uh, yards per catch. So like, yeah. that's impressive, you know, with eight touchdowns. So I think, you know, again, I was like, I didn't even look at these numbers before I said it. He had 48 receptions last year. And I said, he's going to have around 50. He's not going to have a thousand yards. He just had just under 900, close to 20 yard average. He had 18.7 last year. And he scored eight touchdowns, including one. He had a, a a long touchdown catch of 85 yards. So I think that's what you're going to see from Aguilar. He's not going to put up crazy numbers, but once in a great while, I think you're going to see him put up that long touchdown catch. That's what I, I agree. I think that's that's um, what you would expect. Now, just for the sake of time, we actually covered more 
than I thought we would with the time that we used for this podcast. And our third man wasn't able to join us um, for personal reasons, taking care of, uh, he's got family stuff, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to leave on this because I wanted to throw some fire because the third man's not on the call. So I wanted to throw this fireball. And that way, when he joins us, hopefully next week, and we do more draft discussion, he'll be angry, Jarvis, because what he's, He's funnier when he's angry, Jarvis, because yes. it gives us something to like. In, we don't like mopey Jarvis. We like angry Jarvis. No, no right? we don't like low energy Jarvis. Yeah, exactly. We like angry Jarvis. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Low energy Jarvis. That's perfect. So I wanted to finish with this fireball because, you know, and, and I know Jarvis's wife also agrees with us, feels the same way we do with this. This is why she's our new favorite listener uh, of, of the people that do listen to our podcast. Brett, uh, Aaron Rodgers is just even more of a bitch than ever. Like he went, he's taking it to a level that I thought you couldn't become more of a bitch and hateable. He, he wants to take his ball and go home. That's what, that's what he wants to do. Cause he hates the GM so much. Then you hear today that he's actually sabotaging free agency. So like he's going out and telling free agents, I'm not going to be here next year. Don't even ball. Can you imagine? Yeah. Like, have you ever heard of a player doing something outright to destroy a team because he he, he wants to screw the GM? Because that the free agency is the GM's going out and doing all the recruiting, and he hates him so much. He wants to make sure he doesn't get anybody, so he looks like a total bum and gets yeah. him fired. Like that is that's the but character Aaron, of Brett. But Aaron Jones yeah. resigned with them. Aaron Jones did resign with him as a running back. So maybe he just, maybe Aaron Jones just didn't care and was like, I don't care. I still want he to, wants stay to get here. paid. Yeah. He wants he to get, yeah, he wanted to get paid. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. But, but if that's, that story is true, which, which I, I think it is, I mean, you're right. He is, he is a bigger douchebag than, than we've, we've all, than we've all thought because you play for a team your whole career. He's been there now for what? 15 years now, 14 years, maybe. I mean, he's been there a while. I know the first couple of years he didn't, he didn't start. Yeah. He was still backing up Brett Favre, but he was there. And to just to leave like that, I wonder how the fans feel about him because sure. He won them a super bowl, but it was 11 years ago, 10 years. It was so long ago that, you know, even in, in years where he was the MVP, like last year, he just chokes in the playoffs. So I can't see, I can't imagine a lot of fans being very happy with him. And now pulling this shit where it's like, okay, look, if you're not happy here and you want to leave, then leave, go, go elsewhere, but don't take our team down with you. Like, yeah. don't, don't like kill like the, the team's chances of, of succeeding in the future. They got this young quarterback they drafted a year ago and in, in, in love. Right. And it's like, you know, if he's the future, like give him weapons. Don't, don't like, don't screw up just because you don't like the general manager. It's not about the general manager. It's about the team. It's about the fans. It's about the organization. It's if that, that's, that's, if that's true, then, you know, shame on him. Well, how does he show his face to the team? Now think about if you're a teammate of his, you're looking forward to 2021, you're getting psyched up for the year and you're looking for talent to join you, to help you. And your quarterback is basically making sure no one comes to help you. He's basically assuring that you're going to lose. And, you know, again, in the NFL, you don't have 20, 30 years to play or whatever. Not, not everybody's Tom Brady. Some of them have a very short window to be successful. Yeah. You know, like, and, and here you have this guy, like, so arrogant that he doesn't care. He's a, he's a millionaire. He doesn't care anymore. And you have guys that are just fighting for a career. Yeah. Screw them. I don't care if you guys win or lose. I just want to get paid. And then you start hearing that the Green Bay is going to start filing tampering charges because there's other teams already. Like, he's in other teams' ears. Like, yeah, get me out of here. Like, I'm going to – like, that is such a – he's such a sleazy guy. And it makes you appreciate – I mean, as, as much as Brady was becoming a diva near the end, he was nowhere near this. Like, this is like another level. This. Yeah, this is like this, this is this bad. is Jarvis's hero here. Jarvis's hero. That's just you know, well, it's like uh, it's like um, uh, gee, it's been so long since we've seen the show, The Boys. Yeah. Who's the uh, the main character? Right? It's like everybody loves him. He's like the Superman character, but behind the scenes, he's doing some real shady shit. You know? Yeah, that's, yeah absolutely. That's Aaron Rodgers. That's who he is. It's so sad, and it, it and it, it's infuriating to think and. 
And I was, I was wondering, and this is like a conspiracy theory, if he ends up in Denver, and that might explain why Denver wasn't in a quarterback hunt. Maybe they Maybe have they already been something. in communications yeah. Yeah, he's with the guy. Rodgers. Yeah, he's the, he, that's the team that, uh, that you've been hearing a lot of. And in fact, um, on draft day, um, that's, the, that's, that's the source I got that it was almost, a, it, somebody said it was almost a, a lock that that uh Favre was going to be traded to denver and i thought rogers. maybe rogers. rogers what did i say Favre. 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 <laughs> i'm going back to brett Favre now yeah how's it feel yeah rogers was gonna... <laughs> at least i was in the same uh the same no 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 no, no 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 i got grief because i was like one like the guy just just retired Favre, come on <laughs> i just loved Favre when he played but rogers Going to Denver, I thought it was going to happen during the draft. It was going to be a trade during the draft, and that then the. But I think it was just too early with with that whole story with Rogers wanting out. But I think it's going to end up happening. I think it's going to, from now until training camp, it's going to end up happening. There's going to be something where Rogers gets traded. Now Green Bay has come out and said, "No, we don't want to trade him. He's ours, whatever." But if you're if you're just if Rogers is just he's done, and he like what does he do? Does he retire if they don't trade him? Like, what, what, what is the next step for him? Does he just suck it up and play for them? And I just don't understand like how how that's going to work out in the end if he's just convinced he wants to get out and they don't trade him. And if they do trade him, I think Denver is like really the only place because everybody else has got their quarterback. They drafted a young quarterback. They got an up and comer. They got something going on there in the quarterback position. Denver is like really the only team that's still sitting there like. Yeah, we got Drew Locke, but we're not that convinced it's going to be Drew Locke. And with all the stories coming out with John Elway, he did it before with Manning. He's, yeah, I think he's going to do it again with Favre. I, uh, uh, Rogers, I said Favre yeah. again. Yeah, you're obsessed with Favre. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I got Favre on my on my mind. I don't know. Favre, he's on the mind. Gunslinger's on the mind. Yes. Uh, I know one person that would love love that because he was the biggest fan of Brett Favre that we know. Uh yeah, you know what, John, but I wouldn't be surprised if a team, you know, all the rumors, remember how we were hearing, uh, oh, Miami might trade Tua for Deshaun Watson. Well, what if what if Miami said, hey, Brett Favre, why don't you come to a big market like Miami? Like, you know, like not a big market per se, but a market that's got that lifestyle, like the glamour. I don't know if that would fit because I've heard rumors that he likes to kind of be isolated. He's not one of those people that – Wants to be in the spot. Well, he likes to be in the spotlight, but not. He's not a clubbing kind of guy, or whatever. But who knows? Like, why wouldn't someone like a team like say, "Hey, we'll give you Tua for for three or four years of uh, for Aaron Rodgers," yeah. or you know, uh, I'm thinking like there's got to be a teams out there that are like, well, you, why not? Well you, meant, well, you mentioned one earlier, Houston. Yeah, <laughs> Houston. Houston might be needing a quarterback because it doesn't look like Deshaun Watson's going to be playing anytime soon. Yeah. So. What about a disgruntled? Why don't you trade? Uh, Russell Wilson, who's disgruntled to Green Bay and say, Aaron, why don't you come here? And we'll swap our two disgruntled quarterbacks. You know, it's kind of sad. This is a year where you, you're seeing more big names coming out, like a resurgence of good quarterbacks. And a lot of them are disgruntled. You're like, eh, this is kind of frustrating. Like, Meanwhile, Tom Brady's just down in Tampa. Yeah. You're like, yep. It's like, I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it goes, no competition. There goes like the, my biggest threat in the NFC. He's not happy. Not worried about him. Yep. Gone. Russell Wilson. Gone. He's not happy. <laughs> so, and there's there's Tom Brady getting all his toys and like getting everybody his- can bring it everybody back, and he's yep. just like, yep, getting paid big bucks <laughs> and living the life down in Tampa. He's got his buddy Gronk there. He's pretty soon it's going to be Edelman's going to be coming into town. Tom's just like, I'm in heaven. This is like this is exactly what I've exactly what I've been missing my whole career. Like I could have had this. Yeah, Instead, I was stuck with Belichick for 20 years. And I think so. this is all Brady's fault. This is the Brady factor. Everybody's seen Brady leave Belichick and is so happy down in Florida. Now, all of a sudden, Russell Wilson's chirping wants to get the hell out. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> wants to get out. Deshaun Watson wants to get out. So this is all comes back to Brady, that yep. prick. <laughs> so it, that's what it comes back to. He is destroying the NFL because uh, he won't freaking retire. He's living. He's uh, immortal. He's some freak of nature, and he's winning Super Bowls. It's going to turn into like the LeBron show, where any like you're not going to have like if Brady's in the Super Bowl next year, you're like, yeah, Brady's got it. Like, forget yeah. it. Don't even watch it anymore. It's like it's <laughs> it's it's all set. 
it's getting crazy. But yeah, so you know what? Jarvis is going to have to spend most of the podcast defending his boy. Because you know, there's one guy I know that's not pulling this crap is Mahomes. Mahomes isn't pulling this crap on his team. Mahomes is a good soldier. Not like his scumbag like uh, hero, Rodgers. Mahomes, Mahomes is also $500 million <laughs> rich as well, signing after a huge signing with uh, with uh, Kansas City. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? We'll, we'll, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens because you know I think, I think Jarvis is going to come back and he's gonna try to defend Rogers at the next podcast, and I don't know how he's gonna how he's gonna pull this off, but he's gonna he's gonna try to come up with something, and um, and who knows? Maybe by next next week at the next podcast, Rogers might not be in Green Bay. He might be in Denver. He might be swapped with Russell Wilson. <laughs> as you, as you, uh, you never know. You never know. So um, you know, there's awesome. rumors that he might be in in New England. Maybe he comes in New England and. You know, uh, Cam Newton goes there and he starts for a year or two before Mac Jones comes over. I, who knows? Who knows what will happen in the crazy world of the NFL? Now, if that is that does happen, you do know we'll, we'll have to delete this podcast from existence and pretend it never happened. Because now we'll get, if Rogers does That's get right. traded to England, we can't keep going forward and saying how much of a scumbag he is. We would That's have right. to like do this whole total like mask on like oh no no he was the greatest we're so excited to have him because he's anybody but cam so yeah, that's yeah, yeah. that that is boy that would really be like putting your tail between your legs and like oh uh, what what we would say is like no 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 he he was he was kind of a douche back like before the diva <laughs> but now he's learned his ways he's changed he's changed just listen to him in the interviews like he loves it in new england like He's a, he he knows he understands he's made a mistake. He loves so the we're cold. Willing to, we're willing <laughs> to forgive him. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, by the way, speaking of the cold, Mac Jones did say something. He said he's never seen snow before. Uh, did you hear that he was interviewed and he said he's no. never seen snow before? And I said, oh boy. I said that's not that's not a good sign. <laughs> well, brace said, yourself, buddy. I, I said you might want to just you know throw a couple of footballs in the snow before he uh, <laughs> before he decides to, to to play here. Oh, it doesn't uh, matter. We'll see. By the Good way, figure. just one my my last uh, thought about uh, the Patriots draft because it's an after afterthought because they got him in the seventh round. But I like that kid Trey Nixon that they got for the wide receiver in the seventh round. I think he could end up being like the next like Julian Edelman type guy because Julian Edelman was drafted in the seventh round as well. And uh, he was Ernie Adams, uh, you know, it was his pick. Yeah, right? going away just gift. gave him the red, just like, hey, just pick whoever you want. Yeah. And he just went out, like, oh, Trey Nixon. So I, I, I do like, if you look at some of the tape on this kid, he didn't play at all last year because of an injury. But every year before that, he improved. He was getting better and better and better. And he's taller than I thought he was. He's 6'2". I thought he was like another like 5'10", young, yeah, short kid. No, he's 6'2". And he seemed, he looks like he's pretty athletic, strong, looks like he's, uh, he could play. So he might be a surprise pick. We might be hearing about him for, for a long time in the NFL. Yeah, let's some. hope. Let's hope. You know, it, it, those, those draft picks, later on picks, if they turn out, those are just bonuses. You know, that's yeah. just gravy if they, if they turn up. Um, yeah. Uh, you know what? We'll save, we'll do a deeper dive in the draft. Um, when Jarvis comes in, because you know we've we've been going for a while. Surprisingly, we went for a long while on this podcast. Uh, so we'll save a lot of it for Jarvis, and then we'll definitely dive into the Green Bay thing uh, going forward. So, um, but other than that, big meat. Any last closing thoughts before we wrap it up? Uh, no, no, no closing thoughts uh, for me. Other than uh, I, I'm going to go and and watch uh, the 1995 version of Mortal Kombat. To, uh, there you go. Well, to compare and contrast with the new Mortal Kombat. Well, well, folks, if you're wondering, uh, Meat is in his remote location. In uh, <laughs> he, he he's flying solo, so he's looking for things to do. So this is his chance to catch up gotta, on a lot of his gotta uh, TV keep shows. busy. Got to yeah. keep busy. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, and, and you and you go watch the Macho Man uh, uh, biography. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm actually excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, it's just finding time now. That we're in the, this is the spring is the hardest with sports. All three kids go at the same time. It's just oh, yeah. every night. Every night is a game practice or something. So, so my TV time is very, very challenging. Uh, so I have to be very selective. But the Macho Man is I'm, I make time for it. Like that's like I, I sat down and. Couldn't wait for the the, the Roddy Piper show, yeah. uh, documentary. So, anyways, must watch. 
we'll leave it there. Definitely must watch. Um, all right, big meat. Uh, this was good. It was a good review. Congratulations on the Mac Jones pick. I have to give you credit for it. And, uh, you know, we'll have Jarvis on hopefully next time. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to see what's the next, what's the next prediction. I just, you know, I got to give it some thought. When you start making bets this year, 2021 has been your year. When you start making like the bets for the NFL season, I think people are going to be jumping on. We're going to have a little section for you to give us the pick of the week. Because Big Me can't be wrong this year. There you go. I can't. I can't. <laughs> but, like, but like Roddy Piper, it's not off the cuff. I just got to, you know, I got to make my notes. I got to like research the stuff, right? Yeah. Like, you got the binder. I like to be prepared for this stuff before I make my bold predictions. Well, you did a good job. I I, 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 I was at awe. I was at awe. Um, all right, Big Meat. We'll wrap it up there. And for everybody listening, um, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'm going to repeat it. Just if you haven't been able to find us, uh, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, we're there. You can review it. Spread the word. Um, that would actually help if, you know, big, let people know. Big Meat made some predictions. And, you know, we were pretty spot on. So with a lot of those predictions and Jarvis added, and he was pretty, he was really close with a lot of his and you guys did a good job. So share the wealth, share, let everybody know. And other than that, big meat, have a good night. <laughs>